Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us from around the world. I see we have people from multiple different countries. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to CVGHM in Indonesia for hosting us tonight. So I'm going to go through a brief introduction to what we are doing tonight to our speakers, myself, a bit of a history of CVGHM and why we are doing this webinar to celebrate. And then we'll get started with three presentations and then questions and answers from our panelists. So tonight we are one of many different events for the 100th anniversary of the beginning of volcano monitoring in Indonesia. We have the webinar for risk communication, the keys to a better community response, challenges in risk communication with different local needs, risk perceptions and local wisdom during volcano crises. So volcano monitoring in Indonesia began in 1919 with a tragedy. Over 5,000 lives were lost when Kailod volcano erupted. A little over a year later, the, the Volcano Guard Office had been established to try and prevent this tragedy from happening again at other volcanoes. Between 1920 and 1941, volcano observatories had been developed at volcanoes like Krakatau, Tankuban Parahu, Merapi, Semeru, and Ijen. From 1942 to 2001, the Directorate of Volcanology or the Volcanological Survey of Indonesia was established. Through these many decades, there was a wealth of experience of volcano science and different eruptions that were undertaken with response with regards to helping communities. This is not only an amazing, incredible wealth of knowledge for Indonesia, but for volcanologists and volcano observatories around the world. From 2001, to modern, to our current day here in 2020, the Center for Volcanology and Geological Hazard Mitigation was set up as we know it now, or CVGHM, and in Indonesian, PVMBG. So we have two acronyms for this organization. So this has taken us through to some incredible innovations and Magma Indonesia is one of these. CVGHM is the only institution in Indonesia that has mandates for monitoring and they've created this incredible tool, this platform to help communicate different hazards, including volcanoes, earthquakes, landslides, and tsunami. So this platform helps to communicate for a range of different people instantly, so that when something begins to happen, or as soon as we know something is happening, people can get that information and act on it immediately, making life, potentially life or death decisions with that information. We can have the best science, the best scientists and the best technology in the world. But unless we can communicate that information to people as they need it, where they need it in a way that they can get it, we're not doing as much of a job as we can. So to go over how tonight is going to work, we have participants on Zoom and we have participants on YouTube. So you can ask questions throughout the evening on both Zoom and YouTube, and I will be monitoring all of these. I have different screens set up, so if you see me looking around, that's what I'm doing. I will be contacting people through Zoom to ask their questions live, so keep an eye on your chat box if you're on Zoom. Please make sure your questions are brief, clear, and ask. please add your name and affiliation with your question. Any additional questions can be asked as well through the Q&A box in Zoom or on the YouTube link. Anything beyond this after the presentation can also be asked through the contact details given on the flyers that have been shared on the internet. Um, for all of you participants joining us tonight, you can get a certificate. There will be a link afterwards to fill in a survey and your details and that will be sent to you. So with the panel tonight, I am volcanologist, Dr. Janine Krippner. I am here in Washington, D.C. with the Smithsonian Institution Global Volcanism Program. We have three incredible speakers tonight. We have Dr. Graham Leonard, the Senior Volcanologist at GNS Science in New Zealand, Dr. Sally Potter, a Social Scientist at GNS in New Zealand, and Dr. Supriyati Andre Stuti at CBGHM in our host country, Indonesia. With me, I also have Dr. Demi Sabiana, so, so, sorry, I'm getting my tongue tied already. 
also at CBGHM, the head of Eastern Volcano Monitoring in Indonesia. So before we get started, we have Sally and Graham who are going to give a presentation about White Island or Fakati. And Dr. Supriyani, Supriyati is going to be talking about the Karangatang volcano crisis. But Debbie is going to give a few words in Indonesia before we get started. Over to you, Debbie. Okay, uh, thank you, Janine. Uh, I will give a sh very brief uh, introduction in Indonesian uh, for Indonesian participants. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat pagi. Kami ucapkan kepada para peserta webinar dalam rangka memperingati 100 tahun pemantauan gunung api di Indonesia. Uh, sesi webinar kali ini akan dipandu oleh uh, Dr. Janine Kripner dari Smithsonian Institute uh, Institution di Amerika Serikat dan saya sendiri Devi Kamil Syahbana dari Pusat Vulkanologi dan Mitigasi Bencana Geologi Indonesia. Uh, pembicara pada hari ini ada dua orang uh, dari Pusat Sains Geologi dan Nuklir di Selandia Baru yaitu Bapak uh, Dr. Graham Leonard dan uh, Dr. Sally Potter. Dan satu orang uh, lagi dari Pusat uh, Vulkanologi dan Mitigasi Bencana Geologi Indonesia, yaitu Ibu Supriyati Andreas Suti. Pada kesempatan uh, kali ini, uh, saya bermaksud untuk menyampaikan beberapa informasi penting secara singkat sebagai uh, berikut. ya. Yang pertama, uh, setiap pembicara akan melakukan presentasi selama kurang lebih 20 menit. Uh, selama presentasi ini, pertanyaan dapat uh, dilakukan oleh para peserta dan nantinya akan dijawab setelah pada sesi uh, tanya jawab di akhir acara. Kemudian uh, harap menyampaikan pertanyaan melalui fitur Q&A. Uh, jadi uh, para peserta dapat melihat di layarnya ya ada Q&A agar bisa bertanya melalui fitur Q&A agar uh, para pembicara nantinya dapat membaca secara langsung dan lebih mudah juga dapat merespon pertanyaan tersebut secara tekstual maupun nanti secara oral. Kemudian uh, peserta yang merasa lebih nyaman untuk bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia, silahkan bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, kami akan menerjemahkannya untuk ditanyakan ke para pembicara yang dituju. Uh, link dan tautan untuk memperoleh sertifikat akan disampaikan di akhir acara. Uh, jadi uh, tidak perlu lagi bertanya di kolom chat ya. Nanti link dan tautannya akan disampaikan. Baik, uh, sekian saja dari uh, saya. Selima, uh, selamat mengikuti webinar uh, sesi risk communication yang akan dipandu oleh uh, Jan Kritmer. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, we have finished with the Indonesian introduction. Please, uh, Dr. Graham Leonard, uh, you could already start your presentation. Thanks, David. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, very clear. Right, thank you. Good morning and, and good evening to people around the world. Uh, my name's Graham, as introduced. I work here at GNS Science, uh, uh, Geological Survey and Monitoring Agency in uh, Volcano maps and hazard maps and also warnings research. And with me today is uh, Sally Potter. Uh, I'm going to start off our presentation. Uh, we'll be talking about communication around unrest and eruption in New Zealand, and I will give that broader context. And then Sally will focus in on the communication um, around the recent Fakati eruption. Sally, do you want to introduce your background and your, your science? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Graham. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm a social scientist here at GNE Science near Wellington, New Zealand. Um, I do research on how people respond to warnings for geohazards as well as for weather warnings. Um, and so I then look at how we can improve our communications to get a more appropriate response if possible. Okay, uh, so I will start sharing my screen and we'll work through our presentation. Great. Can you see our screen clearly? Yes, we can. Right, thank you. Okay. And congratulations on your 100 years of, of monitoring and volcano hazard communication in, uh, in Indonesia. So a long time period and a, and a great milestone and we're privileged to be involved. Thank you for uh, including us today. Okay, I'll try to click on there. There we go. Okay, so New Zealand uh, has three broad kinds of volcanoes that we'll be talking about communication related to. In Auckland, under our largest city with about one and a half million of our five million people sitting on top of it, we have a basalt field of a lot of uh, lava flows and little scoria cones. It's a reasonably small eruptions and small volcanoes in this field, this volcanic field. However, with our largest city on top of it, there is still a substantial volcanic hazard uh, 
and potential impact there. We have several andesite strata volcanoes, uh, the iconic Ruapehu and Tongariro volcano here, pictured in 95, 96 eruptions. Narahoe is a cone on Tongariro. These are down in the middle of the central North Island and they are part of an arc of volcanoes that travel that runs with the plate boundary all the way up to, uh, to Tonga and Samoa on the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, beyond Ruapehu and Tongariro, there is a caldera complex. So the third type of volcanoes are these large rhyolite or silicic caldera volcanoes. This is the most recent caldera collapse uh, in New Zealand and the most recent super eruption in the world, uh, forming the Lake Taupo caldera here. And there are other calderas too in the Rotorua, Okotaina and other areas. And they all sit in the middle of the central North Island. And then further offshore, again, we're back to being dominated by andesite stratovolcanoes. And White Island or Fakari is another one of these with its tip poking through the ocean. And they continue offshore all the way to, to Tonga. Set back, we have one other stratovolcano, uh, which tends, Taranaki, tends to build up stacks of lava domes that collapse and give you debris avalanches. So basalt fields, andesite volcanoes, and rhyolite caldera volcanoes. When we think about the risk from natural hazards, our risk management across all hazards uh, is governed by our response to the post-Sendai framework, the 2015 Sendai framework for um, resilience and risk management through to 2030. And in New Zealand, we have the National Disaster Resilience Strategy as our document that guides us towards a path of more resilience to all of these hazards, including volcanic hazards, and separates out social, cultural, economic, uh, natural resilience and the role of governance in there. Uh, GNS science uh, are part of uh, this, uh, this system. Emergency management take care of risk management, risk decision-making, and we are the science agency that provides underpinning information and monitoring scientific data. For volcano monitoring in New Zealand, GNS Science uh, is the, the mandated uh, science advisor to government and the public around geohazards. And we run the GeoNet program, which is part of our GNS Science organization, and we monitor New Zealand's geohazards through GeoNet. So that's volcano, tsunami, earthquake, and landslide monitoring and device. For the last couple of years, we have run a national geohazard monitoring center now as well, uh, which has staff has up to four uh, on course, oh, sorry, on duty staff at uh, in a monitoring center 24 seven in shifts to monitor all of those geohazards for, for rapid response, especially for tsunami, but also to support earthquake, volcano and uh, landslide response. The other key structure I'd like to point to in New Zealand is uh, our Volca New Zealand Volcano Science Advisory Panel. So this is a national panel from, of scientists from all universities and research agencies providing research advice and coordination for the country during an eruption. And this diagram basically signifies that this panel uh, links to our GNN monitoring, but also operates infrastructure lifeline subgroups, agriculture and health subgroups, which provide direct advice to relevant agencies scientific underpinning advice to those agencies in an event and we also work with civil aviation authority uh, and all of these agencies through government uh, emergency managers are informing the public and the wider media we're going to focus in a couple of slides with sally's uh, part of the presentation on the dynamic communication around the Fakari eruption the tragic Fakari eruption last year in december uh, but just to, a couple of slides to frame some of the wider communication uh, we're involved with. So we partner with other agencies to develop hazard communication resources around the world, and especially for New Zealand. Uh, as for, for volcanic ash, which we recognize as our, our most frequent and widely disruptive hazard, we've worked over the last two decades with USGS to develop the Volcanic Impacts website that looks like this and is at this address. There are a wide range of other materials we've worked on as well. We have a series of more than 10 uh, infrastructure, infrastructure from ash impact posters developed with those infrastructure agencies in New Zealand. You can get to them on this website. We're working with USGS and VDAP at the moment to internationalize these and translate them into other languages. So I believe they will be available 
uh, in Indonesia in the future through BDAP and USAID and USGS. And we partner with the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network to create resources like this brochure around the hazards of volcanic ash. You can find all of these brochures and resources on the IVHHN's website simply by Googling IVHHN or the links to all these resources are here under resources on this website. So uh, there are a bunch of new resources here, including using masks and respiratory protection for ash uh, and other aspects of health impacts from volcanoes. The other long-term uh, hazard and science communication tool I'd like to highlight uh, is our involvement with hazard maps. And we provide the science basis here alongside our emergency managers messaging. And we recognize and are working towards a new framework for hazard mapping in New Zealand, where we are explicitly looking at what the communication or zone purposes on our hazard maps up front from emergency managers to then provide a science basis for any zones or technical material behind that zone, but leading by message. And the two main types of, of map we have uh, are on screen at the moment. On the left, we have these background long-term hazard map products that explain during quiet times what the, uh, what the most likely hazards might be at a location. This is for Tongariro. And on the right is an example of an event map. So this map emerged uh, and we produced that to support emergency managers in 2012 when the Tamari eruption happened on the north edge here of this wider volcanic center. And it focused on those local hazards, flying rocks uh, and surges, and also flow hazards from that area and the emergency manager messaging around what people need to do all in one shared product. The, um, the other key factor here is in our domestic hazard communication uh, elements, we are increasingly partnering with Maori, uh, local um, indigenous people in New Zealand. And there is a, there's a key element on this poster um, that is in response to values from that group. Uh, Maori don't recognize hazard as a concept directly related to a natural feature so much. Uh, these mountains, in fact, are considered to be ancestors in uh, uh, Tao Maori, the Maori worldview. And so attributing, um, I guess, the danger or the hazard to uh, the volcano itself uh, or um, implicating the volcano itself doesn't, uh, is, is not, the ideal approach in the Māori worldview. So instead, we talk about the hazards and what to do within our poster, but we talk about the map in general as a phenomena map rather than blaming their ancestor itself, the mountain to Māori, for the hazard directly. And that, that, um, that accommodation is part of the collaboration, the growing collaboration with local Māori tangata whenua. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Sally now to focus on the communication during Fakari. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as an overview of um, the Weiss Island or Fakari volcano, it sits about 50 kilometers off the coast of the Bay of Plenty, which you can see in the map there. It's a popular tourist destination, um, and people take a helicopter or a boat to get to there. And it's, we have about 30,000 visitors there um, per year before the eruption occurred. So White Island moved from alert level one to alert level two in mid-November 2019. So you can see our volcanic alert level system there. This was revised in 2014 um, when we did a whole lot of social science research, this was for my PhD, um, interviewing our stakeholders and working with the volcanologists to make a new volcanic alert level system that would um, work for all of our different types of volcanoes that Graham outlined earlier. So level zero is for no volcanic unrest, levels one and two are for unrest, and levels three, four, and five are for um, increasingly um, larger eruptions. So we make those decisions um, based on voting for our volcanologists at GNS Science. But we also take on board some of the discussions that we have with volcanologists um, throughout New Zealand and even internationally. So prior to the White Island eruption, we put out volcanic alert bulletins describing the unrest on the, um, on the dates that you can see on the slide there. The last monitoring visit before the eruption was on the 4th of December, just five days earlier. 
The eruption occurred at 2.11 in the afternoon on the 9th of December, it was a Monday last year. It was very short lived, only one to two minutes long, and it produced a surge in ash cloud that covered um, most of the volcano. You can see on the bottom left image there, um, the highlighted area is what was covered by this ash cloud. There were no immediate precursors to this eruption. And unfortunately, there were 47 people on the island at the time. So immediately, within 20 minutes, we put out a volcanic alert bulletin which acknowledged that eruption and also some social media. We immediately raised the alert level to four. This is our default level until we can ascertain how large the eruption was. And by 4.25 in the afternoon, we put out another bulletin which described the eruption, which had already finished, so it was very short, and we lowered the alert level down to three. This was, after all, just a minor volcanic eruption. It was small, unfortunately, with very tragic consequences. So as an overview of our volcanic alert bulletins, we include information on empathetic messaging. So first of all, we would say we understand this is a tragic event, and, and we're thinking about the families and people involved. We outline what the volcanic alert level is and whether it has changed or not. We include the eruption likely code if we're able to do so. We put in um, a description of the current volcanic activity and what our scientific interpretations of that data are. We describe what our monitoring plans are and we also look to um, other agencies which might have the information on the kind of what to do messaging. The next day, we wanted to be able to say what the likelihood of an eruption was so that we could assist with the response decisions that were being made by the people wanting to go back to the island in order to recover the bodies. But unfortunately, we weren't able to give any numbers yet of the actual likelihood of an eruption. And so we thought what we can do is give three scenarios. We thought the, the least likely was that there would be a large eruption but then the, the first two scenarios was that there'd be no further eruption in the next 24 hours or a smaller or similar sized eruption. And this was a very difficult thing to try and communicate. By day three, we were able to actually give an eruption likelihood as a number, but with high uncertainty. And we continued to put these eruption likelihoods out every day. This was going to assist with those response decisions for the body recovery. So this was the first eruption likelihood or forecast that we had put out. It went out on the GeoNet website, so publicly, and it also went straight to the responding agencies. The article that was written was based on social science best practice, which we developed from years of research, including from the Canterbury earthquakes from 2010. Um, and each, each larger earthquake we've had since then, we continue to, um, to understand what our stakeholders need in terms of for their decision making. So we based it all on that. In the days after the eruption, the, um, the tremor continued to climb. You can see on that bottom right um, plot that it was getting higher and higher and even higher than during the eruption. So this was a concern. There were also high gas concentrations, which indicated that magma would be shallow under the surface. Do you have anything else to add on this? I'll just, I'll point to the context there from a physical science point of view. So this, this is the period last year, and then you can see it's not uncommon to have these higher levels of um, uh, tremor, ground shaking. And there was a period from 2012 to 2016 where we had previously had eruptions in higher periods of unrest. So that relates to our decision to raise the alert level before the eruption last year. So here is a table of what the likelihood of eruption was um, in the days following the, um, following the eruption. So we put this into our GeoNet News article each day. Um, you can see down the bottom of that table what the likelihood was prior to the eruption. Then the eruption occurred on the 9th of December, and you could see that the, the likelihood slowly decreased over the days. The alert level was two on the 12th of December, um, and then by the Friday, the 13th of December, um, we needed to, we, we lowered the alert level down to two because there were no further eruptions taking place. But you can see that there was still a reasonably high chance of an eruption occurring. And this was when the responding agencies really wanted to get back onto the island to recover the bodies. So they, they attended to the island on the Friday um, and they recovered all of the bodies except for two. 
To assist in their decisions, we provided some uh, calculated risk to life for that recovery team. They also attended the island on the Sunday to try and find those last two bodies, but unfortunately they remained missing. So of the 47 people on the volcano at the time, 21 died and 26 were injured. Throughout the eruption and unrest response, uh, we did a lot of stakeholder engagement. This was including with volcanologists at the local emergency operations centre and at our government office here in Wellington. The GMS Science Volcanologists produced a risk map. This is based on our internal st staff health and safety procedures, but we made the map a lot more um, easier to understand and to read, and we gave that to New Zealand's government to help inform their decisions. Other communications that we did were geonet news articles such as background information about the volcano and previous eruptions. We linked to um, older YouTube videos that we had made already and also made new science update videos made with Graham starring. Um, and we did a lot of media. So there was a lot of online news media, radio, TV and newspaper interviews, press conferences. There was a lot of international interest and we also put out media releases as well as having a social media presence. Overall, our response really required a huge amount of teamwork. This was between the physical scientists and the social scientists, as well as the technicians, between the scientists and our communications team and management at GNS Science, between our GNS staff and also external scientists, both in New Zealand and overseas, and between our scientists and our response agencies. So that concludes our presentation. I'll hand it back to Janine. Thank you so much, Sally and Graham. You've given such a wonderful example of working on the critical intersection of social sciences and the physical science of the volcanoes and the hazards. I cannot stress enough for everyone out there the importance of social sciences and different aspects of different fields in volcanology. We're a very interdisciplinary field and we learn so much. Our field takes leaps and bounds with different eruptions. And we take that forward, not only for that volcano, but for volcanoes around the world. So thank you so much, Graham and Sally. Um, it's a heartbreaking event, but I, I have no doubt that we'll be learning a lot about this eruption that will go forward and help other communities. We're gonna go back to Indonesia now with Dr. Supriyati talking about the Karangatan crisis. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Jenin. Good morning. Selamat pagi untuk kita semua. Today, we will move to local wisdom, the story of local wisdom. Now, I would like to share the presentation. Okay, uh, I would like to discuss about the role of local wisdom in risk communication in general and in more specific in Karangitang Volcano. In diverse community like Indonesia, it is very useful to implement local wisdom mainly during crisis. Why local wisdom is so important in Indonesia? Indonesia has 127 volcanoes and 77 of those are including in type A, which means that have erupted since 1600 years AD. These volcanoes distributed from North Sumatra up to uh, Banda Island and Moluka. They also located in different geographic and dem demographic conditions. Therefore, culture and languages in the community also different. So when we talk about risk of volcano, we need to consider the population beside its potential hazard. Above, we see the population density throughout Indonesia. In the red color represent the highest population density and the green the green is the lowest population density. 
when we talk about when we talk about uh, geographic and demographic condition, we need to consider uh, volcanoes that are volca volcano islands. In Indonesia, we have about 18 volcanoes, volcano islands that uh, show showed in uh, olive dot color, and then also uh, submerged volcanoes in blue color, and the rest in purple color are uh, volcanoes and inland area. And uh, the level of risk, the level of risk uh, depend on not only on hazard, but also on threat and also capacity. And then the geographic and demographic condition cont contribute also to the level of threat. So here I would like to show different eruption in Indonesia. This is Sinabung. Uh, we first, uh, the volcano reactivated in 2010 after long repose, long repose uh, time about 800 years ago. And then uh, this is Mount Angkuk in Bali that, that was uh, well known for tourism. And Karangitang volcano, uh, it is a volcan island. So the type of explosion will affect the mitigation strategy and also uh, the condition of the condition and the location itself uh, where the hazard occurred. Here, uh, I would like to show the several factors involved in volcanic crisis and also affected public as how the, the information distributed and communicate with public because this condition will affect their daily life, both in social and economic lives. It is also important to know how big the eruption will be and what is the scenario. In order to communicate efficiently with public, we implemented local wisdom according to the area where the hazard occurred. In general, we have common sense of local wisdom, such as togetherness that is common amongst Indonesian people. During and after crisis, we also need to consider whether we will provide relocation for the people who affected uh, by the eruption, such as in Sinabung, uh, they provide relocation uh, for the, the people. And what is the point of local wisdom? As I mentioned before, togetherness is very important in Indonesian cult culture. To be born as a group and community is essential to improve community response during crisis. How we can do that? Together, we we'll be able together uh, to be able to reach consensus, to help each other in order to understand risk and to take action with responsibility. Later on, I will show an example of this process. This picture show one of the methods to communicate with people by doing simulation according to the hazard map. Uh, here in Mount Agung, we use a traditional method uh, with hazard map printed in a big size, and then people can see where their house located and what is uh, the hazard, the potential hazard, where the evacuation route, and etc. And then we also uh, do uh, observing uh, in the field and also simulation so people can see and learn what is the potential hazard where they live. This is an example of Sobutan volcano and Kelut volcano. And below, uh, this is Karangitang, uh, Karangitang volcano. This is different because uh, it is a volcanic island. So 
the evacuation, uh, the simulation will be different uh, when we will have evacuation such as in this picture. This is an example of implementation of local wisdom. We have program uh, called Wajiblate or obligatory training program for disaster management. This program uh, was carried out in Merapi since 2008 uh, in collaboration between CHSM, uh, local government, uh, university, and also non-government uh, organization. And the result of these activities are a uh, rest map like shown in this picture and also is OP uh, to, uh, to face uh, during crisis. This picture I took from uh, Vazi Platih book published by UPN in 2012. We can see here location, uh, location of the house where uh, the house with toddler and then also uh, the house with elderly people, this one, and also the house with uh, disabled, disabled people. And this map uh, provided by uh, local villagers uh, and they discuss and define the risk map so, so then uh, they can understand what is happening and what they should do during crisis. The SOP of this, uh, this activity form a, con a consensus uh, to them to uh, act, to respond and to act according uh, their understanding and their responsibility during crisis. Now we move to Karangetang Volcano in North Sulawesi and Siau Island. Karangetang is located in the most no uh, northern part of Sulawesi here, and it is located about 146 kilometers from the capital city of Manado in uh, North Sulawesi. So what is the characteristic of Karangitang Volcano? The Karangitang Volcano has very short uh, repose time. And uh, here, the eruption occurred in August uh, 2019, show that there is uh, two active peaks of Karangitang uh, already erupted simultaneously. But sometime it erupted uh, alternate, alternately uh, between the two. And during the eruption, when avalanche uh, directed to the flank, sometimes it, it will stop in certain uh, point and make a pile, and further uh, it will collapse, uh, producing pyroclastic flow or uh, avalanches. So, therefore, we need to uh, to be aware where is the location of uh, the piles, lava piles, uh, because then we need uh, to anticip anticipate if pyroclastic flow happen uh, in the future. In this slide, we show the mapping of eruption product by drone, uh, which show spread of activity from uh, Northwest up to uh, southeast. The yellow color and the red color line show the direction of uh, avalanches, but the red color represent uh, the prominent direction of the avalanches. In the middle, in the middle of uh, the picture, uh, this is the Karangitang uh, hazard map. The diameter of uh, the, uh, the island is about uh, six kilometers uh, east, uh, west to east. 
and then uh, on the right hand we can see uh, the dis distribution of avalanches that we map through a uh, drone so we can see uh, how far the distance of the avalanche and also uh, which area they were directed okay this is the detail of uh, exclusion zone in Karangitang Volcano during uh, July to August. We can see here that the exclusion zone depends on the direction of the hazard. And the, the length of uh, the exclusion to the north, to the north to northwest is about three kilometers and to the west is about two and a half kilometers. And the rest, the rest of the exclusion zone is about uh, two kilometers. Here we can see, uh, here we can see uh, the lava flow uh, that directed to the north, uh, to Malibuhe uh, River in February that caused uh, that caused isolation of Patbulan village uh, in the northeast. At that time, uh, we have evacuation place at Niambangeng and also at Patbulan village. Uh, because of the weather and also uh, the isolation by uh, this lava flow, so when uh, the uh, local government wanted to send logistic and other needs to uh, Patubulan village, uh, they need to go by boat. But because of uh, the weather at the time is on February, so the wave is, the wave is very uh, very high. So sometimes they couldn't approach uh, the Patubulan village. So here I would like to show uh, when uh, the perception of people about the eruption is different and what is the impact. On July uh, 31st, 2019, we have uh, this appearance like a visual of light big light uh, in uh, that view in certain area. And because at the time uh, the, the weather is cloudy, so uh, people were panicked and start to contact uh, observatory posts. In the past, uh, this kind of light uh, happened when uh, pyroclastic flow occurred uh, at the summit, from the summit. And because of that, then we send collect to a different direction of the volcano. So we can see what happened uh, from the other flank. And finally, we found out that uh, this is happen that happened at that time. And the eruption is not uh, so big. And it occurred as, <coughs> excuse me, it occurred as usual. So, uh, from uh, this experience, we learn that people need to be confirmed and also uh, clarified about the eruption. And it is important for us, mainly for uh, observatory posts, to be ready to answer and clarify what happened uh, during crisis. Now I move to building communication and coordination with public and also uh, with stakeholder. I would like to show what is uh, the progress of communication. Communication along, is a long process to achieve understanding. Here at the bottom uh, picture, we can see we have a workshop and formulation of continuity plan. Uh, the situation is very formal. So sometimes uh, there were uh, arguments and also uh, 
uh, situation that uh, not comfortable for each other uh, because uh, because of lack of understanding. And then uh, after this uh, situation, uh, then we move to outside to do simulation and also up, also observe in the field uh, later. And then the atmosphere of uh, the participant and also the stakeholder will, will be different. They start to uh, ask many questions that we never expect before. And also uh, they respect uh, each other knowledge, not like uh, in the uh, formal discussion. And also uh, during communication here, we communicate with uh, local disaster management agency in Karangetang, and also uh, with the help of uh, army of uh, the Xiao, Xiao Island. So in our conclusion that uh, uh, in the communication, the equality and, and, and inclusiveness are the basis of good communication between stakeholder and public. Uh, so uh, the understanding are achieved. As a conclusion, uh, I would like uh, to say that in our experience, we learn the diversity of community as a great value to grow interaction and improving uh, resources capacity in order to uh, achieve community-based disaster preparedness. Thank you. So I return back to you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's incredible hearing the lessons that you've all learned from different eruptions and events and unrest around the world. So what we're going to do now, um, I'll ask all of our speakers to please turn your cameras on so we have everyone on screen. So for everyone who has questions out there, please ask your questions. Um, if you are directing to a specific speaker, that's okay, or you can have a question to all of the panelists. Um, if you can make sure to have your name and your affiliation, if you have one included with that, that would be fantastic. So you can ask in the Q&A or the chat section in Zoom or the chat section under the YouTube video. So I'm going to be looking across these and asking questions as we go. Uh, the first question that I have for, where did we go? For Sally and Graham. From Arturo Dag, what are the various parameters and thresholds you consider when changing alert levels for New Zealand volcanoes? And are these parameters available in real time for everyone to see? Thanks, Janine. I've just realized our camera needs to be restarted. So I'm just doing that now. So you'll still be able to see oh, no. um, But I'll answer that question while it's happening. I think it's at our end. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, our, yes, our volcano monitoring uh, includes a wide or a range of uh, live data and remote data. Uh, so the cornerstones of monitoring worldwide uh, are applied here as well. That's seismicity, um, earthquakes and, and tremor. That's ground deformation, uh, obviously remote web cameras as well, and then chemistry. Uh, and for the first three, we have uh, quite a bit of live uh, telemetry from most of our active volcanoes for earthquakes, uh, ground deformation, um, cameras, and to a lesser extent, some of the chemistry. The, the key thing with alert levels in New Zealand, our alert levels are descriptive of the physical science in the volcano. It's what the volcano is doing right now. They're not prescriptive at all in terms of any response decision making. So they, our, our risk decision makers uh, use um, the volcanic alert level as a heads up on the current situation but a lot of the detail of what's happening in the volcano is in our volcanic alert bulletin. So they're not hard criteria for moving alert levels and they're they're not used for making decisions um, attached to alert level by an emergency manager. Uh, the, uh, the, the changing of alert levels is uh, conducted by a vote amongst our volcano monitoring group uh, of experts and they at a certain point will vote to move from zero into minor unrest and then from minor into 
moderate or heightened unrest and then up to eruptions, obviously, if that's what you take. Is there anything else? I think just to reiterate that our alert level system is based just on what is currently happening at the volcano and because it needs to be used for all of our volcanoes which vary in, in everything really we can't have those specific thresholds for each um, you know that, that are going to work for each one so um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell really. That's a really good point um, for everyone out there the volcano alert systems can differ across countries. So if you're one of the many people out there who follow the different eruptions that pop up in the news, it's really important to understand that the local country who, or the local volcano observatory might have a slightly different way of communicating that with the different alert levels. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, we have Devi who has a question from one of the attendees. Okay, uh, there is a good question uh, from uh, Dedi Nurani. Uh, he's a, a volcano observer, in fact, <laughs> I think. So uh, the question is, um, I think it's for all the, uh, all the, uh, the panelists. Uh, so he asked, uh, the volcano and the people around, around it have lived around the volcano much earlier than the the formation of the volcanological institutions. So they have uh, customs and, uh, and also traditions that are held uh, related to the volcanoes. So it is the uh, local wisdom. And how do the uh, people at the volcanological institutions make an approach to these people who still are there to this tradition? And how big is the influence on decision-making uh, in, 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 in the framework of, of, of volcanic hazard mitigations. So, uh, Supriyati or Graham or Sally can answer this uh, question. We could give a, I mean, a brief perspective there. Mm -hmm. the, the influence of Maori, Tangata uh, Whenua, the people of the land in New Zealand or indigenous population uh, is as a, as a partner. And this is, um, over recent decades, an important, um, I guess, uh, correct recognition of an obligation under the Treaty of Waitangi, which is a treaty uh, between Europeans and Maori that our, our governance is found, uh, founded on. And within that, there is an increasing role for Maori in joint governance at some volcanoes. Uh, especially, for example, at Tongariro National Park and around the lake bed at Taupo Volcano. So there are aspects of uh, the, the land management, which are uh, increasingly involving and in partnership with Māori. And New Zealand-wide, there is an increasing uh, official role for Māori as a partner in emergency management as well as a, a co-decision maker. Anything you'd like to add on that? Um, no, I think, I think that's probably it. It's kind of in the response and, and management side of things and education and, um, and, and increasing our partnerships in those kind of areas, yeah. Trying to okay. okay. Uh, I, I would like to add how we, we approach uh, with culture. In, uh, in Indonesia, we have different culture and also different language. The first, we need to know about the language and how to approach with the people. Sometimes the custom of uh, the people or the community will uh, affect how we communicate with them. And also uh, the first thing that we, when we communicate, uh, like what, uh, what one of the uh, presenter mentioned last time, we need to be human. It means that we couldn't uh, behave like that we know everything. Also, uh, we need uh, to uh, to be equal. If uh, we, we are in uh, equal uh, condition, then people can talk. But if we are in different level, say uh, we, we are we post our ourselves in higher or in lower it will be different and for example also in karangetang 
because uh, most of them are uh, the religion is uh, Christian. So then we need to approach in uh, in the, their way, not always to follow uh, what they said, but uh, what the the way of their thinking. We need to know, and and then uh, after that. Uh, we also need to uh, to be inclusive with them, and not not spread. I mean, uh, we are different, not like that. But we need to be uh, ming mingling, um, mingle with them, and we can talk uh, anything. And we when uh, the, there's engagement, uh, we can ask even a small thing and then we we can understand what is uh, the root of the problem what is uh, uh, what is the real problem that uh, they need to know this is what i experienced in uh, merapi and in other places and sometimes we need to come and uh, to meet them not only once but many times and then we can understand what is the problem it is a long process thank you Thank you very much. Um, all of our panelists have touched on how important it is to be connecting with the local communities. And this comes with the local cultures, the local religions, the local history with the volcanoes. So we've had a couple of questions based on getting the youth or the children involved or, or educated about volcanic risks. So can all of the panelists speak to the importance of getting children involved and um, actively participating in this process of understanding our connection with volcanoes and risk and what you're doing in your different countries to get these kids involved. An example uh, we could draw on, I know our video's frozen again, we'll keep working on it. Uh, we, we have recently um, been working with our National Museum uh, to Papa in Wellington uh, to showcase uh, volcanoes uh, and especially the, the Central North Island volcanoes uh, in a way that's as engaging as possible, but also connects to understanding of hazard and what I guess what self preparedness and self protective action might be. Uh, right next to earthquake and tsunami, so that broad community resilience for us actually in a museum next to artifacts of rock and also artifacts of, um, uh, for example, the way Māori use specific rocks and pumice, et cetera, uh, traditionally. And in terms of that partnership, going back to the previous theme of connecting with uh, Indigenous people uh, and local people, that exhibition is in partnership with Tuwharatoa, one of the iwi, the tribes that's most connected to uh, the Caldera volcanoes, to the Lake Topor area. So their stories, their purakau, are, are woven directly through that exhibition to provide a link between Mataranga Māori, your traditional knowledge, and the science we're trying to explain. So we're joining traditional knowledge, scientific knowledge, but also our emergency managers have added their preparedness and resilience messages in that National Museum exhibition. And we just opened that last year. Okay, uh, I would like to add uh, what we do in CVCSM uh, Sometimes children visit our institution or we, we visit their school. And then also uh, we have a painting competition. Uh, this is uh, happened in Merapi, in PPTKG, and also in uh, Agung. This is just an example. And then we have also Muppet Show for children. And uh, the last, uh, we also play simulation for children. Uh, for example, during crisis, what we'll do, what we will do after we receive uh, information from the post observatory, and then uh, to uh, the CBCSM, and then to the public. And here we uh, we give each children to have the role in the simulation. For example, who will be the police? Who will be uh, uh, the, the earthquake expert? Who will be uh, 
the the uh, region and etc. So uh, they they can enjoy uh, the simulation and also uh, they can understand what is uh, the procedure of uh, of the people they when uh, they have a crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are a lot of really neat examples in different countries of how people are engaging kids um, through games, through storytelling, through um, there's even, I think it was in Chile or Italy, um, people collecting the stories of the children and how they relate to the, the legends and the stories of the volcanoes. I'm sure I got that country wrong. I apologize if anyone's watching out there. So there's a lot of different ways we can actually get our local communities and different cultures involved in these. Uh, we have a question from YouTube. So both of your countries have the Volcano Observatory and also working with the government, whether it's the Civil Defense or BNPB, um, how does the communication work when you're also getting information coming out from government agencies in your local areas? Oh, okay, let me answer first. Uh, the communication uh, from CVGSM, uh, usually when we have uh, alert level, we will uh, report to a national government agency uh, that uh, as a coordinator of our uh, disaster management and then also we involve uh, we inform to the stakeholder uh, including uh, aviation safety and then also uh, local government and uh, also uh, other stakeholder like uh, BMKG and then public work, public work and etc. We communicate with them uh, either by uh, by phone. Uh, we have also WhatsApp group, and then uh, we sometimes we we give information through through Magma Magma Indonesia, and then uh, the last uh, we did in uh, Agung. Uh, we have also Zoom to give information about the latest situation when we will in, uh, decrease uh, the alert level. That's all. Thank you. We, we were just discussing that. Uh, the coordination of public communication uh, between scientists and emergency managers is really important. Uh, our science understanding and advice about uh, what's happening at the volcano um, and the hazards at the volcano are uh, are generally through our, our website but also uh, in an event through some uh, media uh, interviews uh, and wider uh, communication we also have an app for our journey program that many people have downloaded to their phone which allows people to see the latest earthquake, but also receive from a volcano point of view, our volcanic alert bulletins. But I think the key point is the emergency managers are the lead agency on uh, what people should be doing, what the risks is, and the risk, uh, risk decisions are very clearly uh, managed at that local level and at the emergency management level. So we're informing that with science. To keep those messages coordinated requires good planning ahead of time. So uh, we, we find the most success in places where we have regular planning groups, where emergency managers are planning for their response, and we are planning our scientific research to support that. But we're also planning how to make sure our communication is coordinated. Uh, once those relationships are built, it's much easier to get coordinated uh, complementary communication for the public. Yeah, I think, um, as Graham says, it's really based on that, that relationship that we've built. Um, in a more of a crisis or an evolving situation, we have phone calls that are made from the National Geohazard Monitoring Centre through to the central government, um, to the civil defence um, duty officers, so they know immediately what is going on. Um, and then the volcanic alert bulletins really lay out what, what we think is happening, and that goes directly to email inboxes as well as online to the um, public website. 
Um, there's really a whole, a whole range of communication methods that we use straight to civil defence, um, both at the, the local and regional level as well as to the central level. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Now. Oh, I, actually, I wanted to add to the earlier question about our data. That is freely available. We have, on our websites, the, the, the live streaming monitoring data um, is freely publicly available. We make, we make that available to the public and also scientists. Thank you so much. There is so much work that goes on in the background of making that data available. And then the expertise to actually understand it is a completely different ball game. Um, so as volcanologists, as geophysicists, as social scientists, we all really speak our own languages. After years of writing scientific papers, university degrees, advanced degrees, we get very specialized. We have a very technical language, when we, whether we're talking about earthquakes or gas or remote sensing or any of these different parameters. So how do you go about bridging the communication gap between what we're trying to say and making sure that the communities understand what that means? Yeah, that's a really important point. And I think we've found from our extensive earthquake communication experience here in New Zealand, um, having layers of information is really good. So if you have your very simple message first, which is usually aftershocks will happen, and then from there you'll have your description of more detail, and then you might have links in your article going into even more technical detail. And that way, the, the people who are really are technical and need to know the information can click down to find the information that they need. But generally for our public communications, we do make an effort to make our um, communications as, as, you know, as easy to understand as we can to make sure those important messages have come across and also to have those follow-up phone calls just to make sure that the message is clear. Uh, the way we communicate to the public and to fill the gap, uh, sometimes uh, we need to say in simple uh, in simple way and also uh, when we do something in the field such as we fly drone and many people will come around us we also explain why we need to do this and also what we see uh, and what we'll do what will happen so we do socialization uh, during our work and communicate with them in informal way and Sometimes, uh, when we went to the field, to the field, we also ask people to come with us, so they know what uh, they do and what is uh, uh, the limitation. And then uh, we also uh, explain what is the danger. Uh, this happened in Karangetang because uh, the volcano is very steep, so we need to as uh, local people to follow us. And then uh, we can explain everything and close to the to the location of uh, the avalanches. This is very scary, but then they, they will be happy to accompany us. Not, uh, not like before, because uh, we, we are there for them. And then uh, they will follow us because when they thought when uh, we are with them, so they are safe. This is another thing, but um, and then they are sure that uh, they, they can uh, trust us. Thank you. Thank you. There's, I'm sure, so much has been learned since your respective events, both Karangatang and Fakadi. So what is some of the current work that is being done to prepare for future hazards and risk in both of your countries? In New Zealand, uh, the, uh, I, the emergency management and risk management falls under a, a civil defense emergency management framework. And they, they talk about a, a, a cycle of planning and preparedness, but they also talk about four hours of reduction, readiness, response, and recovery. So with any event like this, uh, our, our colleagues in emergency management and government and in infrastructure are trying to learn uh, how they might improve their planning, but also 
your strategies around where um, where things are uh, and and what the the readiness and response planning is in place. So I know. Uh, there are certainly at other volcanoes around the country. Uh, people are looking at the response plans to those events, and they're also looking at the, uh, I guess, the information about uh, the impacts and the uh, and the science of the eruption to improve their preparedness for the next eruption wherever it is within the country or in the South Pacific. Okay, and go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, in terms of research that we're doing here, I know we'll have a, um, we would like to review the communications that we do as we would after any event to make sure that we um, are communicating as best as we possibly can about what, um, what our volcanoes are up to. Okay, in Karangitang, uh, we pr prepare for disaster management plan because it is compulsory for uh, each area, they need to prepare disaster plan so they can manage uh, resources and also uh, what are need uh, to anticipate uh, the crisis. And also uh, they prepare contingency plan, uh, but this is more detail. Uh, so what they need and also, uh, uh, to know the gap of resources and also uh, uh, what is the gap of uh, knowledge and etc. And then uh, with, by discussing uh, with us, uh, they also uh, define the mitigation strategy. For example, uh, after the uh, February eruption, because of uh, the road is covered by uh, lava flow. They also discuss with us what uh, they will do, what we need to do, and it, is it possible or not? Thank you. Thank you. We are all sitting here in August 2020, and there is a rare global event going on, the pandemic. So has this changed your conversations or any of your methods of how you would communicate an event or any kind of unrest or evacuation when there is something very big already going on? I know New Zealand is in a very different situation to many of the other countries like the one I'm currently in. But has that changed any part of how you would deal with a volcanic crisis? Well, it certainly affected us while we were uh, while we were in a lockdown uh, with community transmission, we were unable to visit the volcanoes uh, easily to conduct field work or uh, even anything other than essential monitoring equipment maintenance. That's easier now for the moment, but our government is very much uh, in a planning phase, assuming that there is a very strong chance of future community transmission events here. So there is a lot of planning and exercising going on. And I know our colleagues uh, in government and emergency management are, are indeed working on contingency plans for how they would deal with a range of hazard events, earthquake, tsunami, volcano, on top of uh, COVID response. I, their main point is if, if it's an immediate life safety response, that that is more important than um, COVID protection, perhaps if a life can be saved immediately. But otherwise, there are considerations to be balanced. Um, and I've, I've seen those discussions in, in the last month or two. Another aspect here is some of the social science, especially, and the warnings research we do is transferable between different perils. So uh, Sally and I have both been involved with uh, some aspects of the warnings and public communication around COVID based on research from earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunami and things like that. I don't know if you want to go into some more details, Sally. Yeah, I just look forward to learning about what my, my health communication colleagues have been doing because they really have run a very effective communication strategy so far. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing really like picking apart how they've done it, what they've done and, and seeing what we can learn from that for future volcano situations. Uh, I know this is a very difficult situation. Uh, and like in Indonesia, we have so many volcanoes and also uh, we have dense populated area. Uh, and for example, in Sinabung that 
now erupting. Uh, it is very difficult because uh, most area around there is in high, uh, I mean, in we watch a lot in uh, this area. So what we, we do, uh, we uh, rely on the observer, observatory post and we have uh, close communication and monitoring uh, for them and uh, also uh, give a suggestion uh, with, with the data. Um, and also the data and we have to evaluate uh, uh, the data and we suggest to them. And also, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, we have Zoom meeting with uh, local government, local disaster management agency. We still have uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp group and uh, we can discuss a lot and sometimes uh, we also uh, call, they also call us uh, if uh, something is important and urgent to, to, to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you just touched on something really important. So the last few decades, we've seen rapid changes and the technology that we have for communication. So how has this been, what are some of the largest changes or the important changes that you've all seen? And how is that really helping or hindering communication in your areas? We, from a technological point of view, there are, are uh, some real opportunities, uh, both at the monitoring end and also the public communication end. In New Zealand, uh, we're experimenting much more with remote monitoring techniques, uh, especially in a, at an active volcano where it might not be so safe to get close for sampling. We're looking at using drones more and more or fluid sampling and also gas sampling and imagery. Then at the public communication end of things, Sally and I have both been involved with uh, new technologies around public alerting. So the research around warning effectiveness, Sally talked about at the beginning. Uh, we now have a system where we, as a country, emergency managers can send a message to uh, almost all of the phones in the country within a few seconds. That has recently been used for our COVID response, our COVID-19 response. And uh, the, the caveat I'd add for, to that is we are realizing not in volcano, but in other hazard areas and probably relevant to the volcano, in tsunami, uh, people are coming to expect that maybe they will receive one of these phone warnings if, there is, um, if there's a possibility of a tsunami coming. And we would be worried that maybe people will feel a very big or long earthquake, yet wait for the technology to warn them when the earthquake was a very good warning itself. So that's, I think that's one of the cautions you're asking for. Some of the challenges from the advances in technology, that's definitely a caution. And I think some of the, some of the areas we're looking to um, explore further in the future will be the crowdsourcing of information, so some citizen science and get get public reports and observations to come through to us here and help inform our decision making. So, looking forward to exploring that a little more. Okay, um, and communication, like uh, for magma, uh, sometimes we have we we don't call it as a problem, but I think people don't understand what is. Uh, the magma and what's the function. Once uh, someone call, uh, call me and ask why uh, the flight is delayed. And then I start to explain that we have Huna and then we observe the, uh, the height of uh, the column. And then if uh, something happen, uh, there is a delay uh, of in certain area, so it means that it possible possible that uh, there is eruption in uh, in that area. So just when we have uh, Agung eruption, many uh, flight delay, and then uh, we need to explain what is fauna. And after that, the person that contact me, 
she explained many things about Fauna. This is uh, uh, useful for us. And I'm happy about, about that. And another thing, when uh, we uh, give information about monitoring, we call it uh, volcanic activ activity report or volcanic eruption uh, notice, uh, fan and uh, far. Uh, people tend to count the number of the earthquake. How many uh, deep earthquake? How many uh, shallow earthquake? And uh, also tremor and etc. And they thought that in certain uh, when certain earthquake happen, uh, it will be eruption. This this not that simple. So this is uh, an uh, an information to us, a feedback to us that we need to give information in more simple so that they don't consider uh, technic uh, technically, like if the number of the earthquake rise this number, then there is a, a crisis or then we need to increase the alert level. This is the example, thank you. Video. Okay, yeah, um, I have a question from Noor. Um, it is related to the local people who live uh, around the volcano. Sometimes we need to, to evacuate them. And, uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, they uh, have their works there and also they, they have uh, yeah, their their activities are, uh, are there, and and on the other hand, also uh, they hear uh, not only from the volcanologists but also from the uh, like uh, local leaders, something like that. So that uh, they there might be uh, like uh, like a dualism uh, in 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 their uh, consideration. So whether they need to uh, follow the volcanologist or the local leader uh, because uh, they have been there for 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 yeah for a long time and 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 some people tend to believe the local leader how you deal with this and how uh, how you communicate this to 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 the people I don't know if we get, can we give an example of that from a New Zealand perspective? I think here it's mainly build those relationships early on between the volcanologists mm. and the local people and the local leaders so that we hopefully avoid a situation like that. But that's It's a very tough situation for those local members of the public and I feel for them. Okay. Uh, in uh, Indonesia case, uh, when we need to evacuate uh, the people, we need to approach the uh, local leader and also uh, the local disaster management agency because uh, mostly they come from uh, this area, uh, from that area. So uh, it is important to understand what is the character of the people. Uh, and also we understand that the source of income uh, will influence uh, for evacuation and also uh, for recommendation. As I uh, showed before, uh, why we put exclusion zone in different uh, distance that that uh, we consider uh, this is uh, the, the consider the situation. So uh, we limited uh, the area that need to be closed so that people still uh, can do uh, and uh, uh, do what they daily life with limited uh, with limited activities and for the local leader yes, it is uh, difficult uh, local leader sometimes 
they have different uh, idea with uh, local government and also sometimes uh, different idea also with us. This is uh, the case of uh, Merapi Volcano uh, in the past in uh, 2006, where uh, the local leader insists to stay in the uh, in their house, and then also uh, during the 2010 eruption. But then uh, after the 2006 eruption. At the time, the direction uh, was uh, toward uh, southeast, and after the activity a bit uh, decreased, uh, the CVCSM people, CQ, uh, BBTKC staff, uh, they have uh, activities that uh, call outbound and ask people to join uh, around that area. So. They have uh, involved and also uh, give a questionnaire. What uh, along uh, along the the, the road, uh, along the track uh, below uh, the concern area, and then by uh, discuss discussing uh, the questionnaire, then they know they know and they understand the situation, because when uh, the hill was eroded by pyroclastic flow, it can be collapsed. And then it happened during 2006 and also 2010. And mostly the eruption directed uh, to the south southeast. So this is a, a good lesson for the people to be involved and see what happened uh, in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there is also a question here uh, about uh, how to handle crisis at different volcanoes. Do you have uh, different protocols for different volcanoes uh, regarding the, the, uh, the different uh, uh, different cultures, for example, and different uh, languages uh, around the volcano. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, to handle crisis, we have uh, we don't have different protocol. We have alert level uh, for alert level from normal and then uh, adversary words and warning uh, no different in uh, the protocol but the different that we should do is how to communicate with the local government and the public and uh, when uh, we need to communicate with the public we need to understand also the culture what we need to do and what we could we cannot do uh, during uh, during the activities uh, and uh, we need to wait and sometime uh, we help by uh, local uh, local official uh, in case we need translation or uh, we need suggestion from uh, from them uh, for example uh, uh, this is presented by Devi uh, last week in Agung Volcano during crisis, uh, Devi will uh, need to talk with uh, local uh, re religious uh, leader because there is a problem uh, to communicate. And in, in Agung, uh, the religion and the culture is very important. Uh, therefore, we need to approach uh, the local culture leader and also the religion uh, leader. After that, uh, they will help us to uh, communicate with the people and also uh, uh, facilitate us to communicate with the people. Thank you. We were just discussing what um, 
the, the situation in New Zealand is that there's one one indigenous language here, Te Reo Māori, and, and also English as the other official language. But there are certainly cultural differences and, and local iwi, local tribes that are uh, have different attachment to the land and different customs in different places. Uh, to date, communication about the science of our volcanoes has been quite focused on the type of volcano, but we are trying to move more into sharing knowledge uh, that's relevant together as a partnership with uh, local iwi. So for example, in the Caldera volcanoes, the local iwi are um, various, but especially to Whatatoa and to Arawa iwi, and we are working with them. Uh, just today we were talking about sharing Mataranga Māori, their local uh, knowledge stories alongside science as a, a lens on understanding the volcanoes. And it would be different iwi at Ruapehu, for example, um, that might be uh, involved and have a different lens on those on those volcanoes. Volcanoes are very important to Māori. Uh, they're a specific, um, often a specific ancestor in uh, Mataranga Māori. So I think that will evolve with more local, especially iwi lakes in the future. Yeah, and other than that, I think it depends on the stakeholders that are around the each volcano. So in some areas, there might be quite a lot of infrastructure agencies that have a high interest. And so we've got those mm. infrastructure posters about ash that we can share and work with them over time. And in other areas, we might have a ski field or a Department of Conservation area. And so we'd be tailoring our communication products to some degree in partnership with them to try and meet those audience needs. So it might be a skier and a hazard map and showing them where to get out of a valley to avoid a laha or um, volcanic mud flow and things like that to tailor the, um, tailor the information as needed. It, I guess the key thing is that, lo that local relationship uh, and communication about what to do comes from the emergency manager uh, or the risk, the risk manager and, and we're providing that underpinning science information in their products. Thank you. Um, I have a question here. We know that social media is the most influential digital communication tool today. Based on your experience, how do you rate the effectiveness of social media being used for hazard communication in New Zealand? And I'll also ask this for Indonesia as well. Is it in accordance with the effort and the cost required? Yeah, I believe so. We had a lot of reach during the Fakati eruption episode to, um, you know, a single tweet can reach hundreds of thousands of people to let them know what is happening and then link them to further information on our website. So, yeah, in my opinion, it's definitely worthwhile. It also opens up the door a little bit more to two-way communication with the public, which things like the volcanic alert bulletins and website content uh, and even news, you know, articles, they're, they're less... Um, they're able to facilitate that kind of discussion. So I think, in, in, in my opinion, it, it is very beneficial. And I know our emergency managers at a, a regional and local scale are heavily using social media throughout the country. For some areas, that's one of their primary forms of communication now for rapid messaging. Yes, I think uh, social media help us to have uh, effective communication besides also uh, in Indonesia, uh, newspaper, into interview by uh, newspaper and also by TV, it is uh, also important. When uh, when a reporter, they ask uh, to have interview to one, one of uh, us that uh, responsible for the volcano, for example, uh, in Agung, Dave is very busy at the time, and the more uh, us willing to help to give information, then uh, people will uh, more more uh, cooperative. And also, sometimes it is not comfortable, but for us as a quick response team in the field. Sometimes reporters always follow us uh, to know what we are doing, even when uh, we, we will go uh, to the field by uh, flying drone, they also need to know what, what is the, the progress. And for uh, 
magma information is very important. Uh, magma application, the information is uh, very important and it reaches uh, to the public and to the stakeholder uh, very fast. And sometimes uh, some people to have a contact person of uh, some staff that uh, they are comfortable to talk with. So uh, this this is the relation that we need to maintain uh, to communicate with uh, public and also uh, to the media. That's all, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we've seen, especially in volcanology in the last three years, just how powerful social media is. Um, I think those of us inside and outside of volcano observatories have seen that that's where a lot of people go for information now, including us, especially during the pandemic. I think a lot of us are seeing that it's this instant requirement of information around the world. And also we have that impacted by a 24 hour news cycle now that we have everything on the internet. So it's a good opportunity for us to see what people are asking, see instantly what people are not understanding, seeing what the uh, misinformation is. This is a huge problem whenever there's a volcanic crisis is the amount of misinformation that gets circulated on social media and in media. We can see that instantly and we can respond to that as it's coming up. So social media has changed so much about how we do this and the amount of work that has to go into it as well. Um, the next question, I am combining a couple questions that have been asked. So how do you approach competing priorities when you're trying to communicate either a crisis or a potential crisis. So whether you have different people with different needs in your community or different priorities with agencies or different government areas, do you have examples of when that has been a challenge and how you've worked around that? I I guess brief, briefly we could we there's always a limited amount of resource in any response and so central government uh, in our case we are primarily informing science to those uh, emergency managers and so we do provide information both locally and to central government and that can that can be a challenge uh, I think it's a, again it's about that planning and even exercising those relationships so that. Uh, you've worked through it and worked out how to prioritize that together as a team. Yeah, and I think having um, our, our way of trying to manage the situation of, of all these people needing information at once, but slightly different information for their response needs, is we send one of our volcanologists to the site, to the local emergency operations center, so they're right there and talking to the people who need that information. They can find out from them what they need and give that straight away or can link it back to our volcanologists at GNS to give that information. So I think that's probably the way that we do it. But in New Zealand, we're, we're very small. We've only got 5 million people and there are only a handful of volcanologists here. And so this is one of the reasons actually why we standardise our volcanic alert level system and some of our other products because it's pretty much the same people responding to every volcano crisis, both in the volcanology and science sector and in the stakeholder sector, it comes back to the same people. So for, that's why for simplicity, we have the same kind of um, communication systems and structures in place to help make that a little bit easier. Yeah, in Indonesia, we have protocol uh, where we give information to the stakeholder. So uh, we have the list of stakeholders uh, that need to be informed. Uh, for example, uh, National Disaster Management Agency, Local Disaster, Disaster Management Agency, and uh, other stakeholders. And also, uh, we need to, when we have several uh, crises, we need to prioritize which one that need to be uh, to be handled, and sometimes we need to uh, appoint which person. Uh, for example, when uh, we have 
like uh, a bit miscommunication and misunderstanding in uh, Agung during Agung crisis. Then uh, we will send a team uh, to communicate with uh, the local government and also with the public. But for other uh, other uh, volcano, for example, in Karangetang, then we saw that the crisis uh, continuously. Uh, we need to know the progress of the eruption. Uh, we will send the staff that uh, will uh, help to evaluate and to prepare more technical uh, data uh, uh, to know and evaluate uh, uh, the, the crisis. And among all, uh, it is important how we communicate uh, to the leader itself, not only uh, local leader uh, by culture, but also uh, local authorities local authorities and also um, uh, local disaster management agency. In some area, uh, we have a very good leader that uh, even uh, I can say that uh, the knowledge is just average, but because of the leader is very good, so uh, we can handle the, the crisis uh, in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. All of you have worked with different groups and in different hazards. Um, for example, I know Graham and Sally have worked extensively with tsunami, earthquakes, and with extreme weather. What are some of the biggest lessons you have learned from other hazards fields that you can have managed to implement in volcanology? Sure, so we've, we've been learning from our earthquakes for about 10 years since the Canterbury earthquakes in 2010. After each earthquake, we'll do some social science research to understand how the stakeholders and the public want information about aftershock forecasts and um, what they use it for, everything to do with the content and the structure of the message. So with each, other, each earthquake, we, we improve our communications a bit more and then we ask them for more feedback. And we keep doing that. And the Fakati eruption was the first time we've translated those findings across into the volcano space, which is pretty cool. But it means that I've now got quite a lot of work ahead of me to understand how that was received and what happened with it. And, and we need to um, improve it really for next time as well. Um, in the weather space, I, I do research on how people respond to impact-based weather warnings with the World Meteorological Organization. So I take a lot of our findings from that, including things like hurricane evacuations in the US, and I understand how we can apply that into, um, into the geohazards. Another example is the emergency mobile alerts or the cell broadcast messages. A lot of that but research is actually based on um, research that's been happening in, the, in America um, and on how they understand these very short warning messages, sometimes only 92 character messages that arrive on your cell phone. Um, and so we've taken those sort of findings and, and brought them into a New Zealand context. And we've been trying that for different things, like recently with COVID, um, using that same sort of template, and we've used it for flooding as well. So um, so yeah, there's lots that we can we can learn from the other, other perils, and I think a lot of work yet to do in that space. Uh, okay, what we learn from a different group in CVGSM, uh, sometimes because of uh, the bigger event. The bigger event, uh, not only in volcano, but also earthquake. Earthquake, uh, sorry, earthquake and landslide. When the big event uh, occurred, uh, then we need to change the hazard map, evaluate the hazard map, uh, and also further we have evaluation on uh, settlement and also uh, provide recommendation for relocation. And then uh, in social media, in social media, uh, sometime during a big event, uh, we have uh, misleading, misleading on information 
because uh, sometimes uh, people want to what can I say uh, stand out from uh, uh, from uh, the situation uh, become popular and uh, etc. Uh, without considering uh, the public and uh, also the impact to the to the public. And in, in this condition, uh, they, they will uh, affect us. Uh, and finally, uh, people will ask us to uh, to the solution. Uh, for example, once uh, we have problem in uh, preparing uh, slide map, this is our mandate, but uh, in certain group, they publish, uh, they publish uh, the map. Uh, at the end, uh, there is uh, uh, there was uh, an event that was uh, uh, the map not useful at all. So they come back uh, to us and uh, they use they use our our map. But then. Uh, we have the impact because we need to convince that uh, our map is uh, is uh, good and appropriate for uh, the hazard. And because of that, also uh, public and sometimes local government they asking resources from us to to know and to understand uh, what is the real information because sometimes. If misleading, uh, they don't have uh, good information, and the public panic, and uh, uh, they come back to us. So, uh, such as this is earthquake that occurred in Lombok. Uh, I was called by uh, one of my friend, my colleague, uh, my university friend. Uh, he asked, "Who who is responsible for uh, for the earthquake information?" Because we do need uh, the good information, not that what we had now. So then we transfer to the uh, earthquake people, and they will respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question here from Anna. What is the biggest challenge you have experienced in handling communication during a volcanic crisis? I think I, I normally find the, the hardest moments early on when you're uncertain about what has happened. So it's remarkable, it can be hard to confirm if there's been an eruption or, what, or how large or what the nature of the eruption is initially. Uh, from a communication point of view, getting situational awareness um, can be difficult. Volcanoes are often remote, so uh, often extra local information is very helpful early on in a, in a volcanic response. Okay. Yeah, and I think the only, the only other thing really in the bigger picture is understanding what people need in those sort of crises, because so we spend years of our time doing research with our stakeholders to understand what they need. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And even for them, it's hard for them to imagine what it will be like and what, what they will need. Um, and so that's the real challenge as well for communication. But it, it's important to do so that when the time comes, we have a fairly good idea of what we need to communicate and when. Uh, I agree with Shelley. Uh, we need to understand what they need uh, from, uh, from the public. Uh, and our biggest challenge in Indonesia, because we have uh, so many cultures and languages, so this is the biggest challenge uh, for us. Uh, but we will do our best, and also with the help of uh, local uh, staff from the observatory, we can do uh, best for giving information to the public. And also, uh, it is important the way how to transfer in information to the public because uh, sometimes people tend to give all what we know but 
as what Sally said, uh, that that's all. That's not all what they need. Uh, what they need sometimes is what will happen, when will happen. So we need to explain this in a simple way. And for example, in uh, Sinapung, that I uh, recognize for a long time that I, 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 will, I was there, is that people need confirmation. When they ask many times, they need to be confirmed. And they are not sure what, uh, what will happen, uh, what they want to know. So they ask for confirmation. Sometimes the question is very simple. Uh, and they will ask so many times to have confirmation for us. Thank you. I might add one of the big challenges we've seen internationally around communication is, is around volcanic ash fall. Once, once ash is coming or it started falling, uh, it, there is a, there is a, uh, it, it is often a delay before any information searching or extra information can, can come in for agencies or the public to understand uh, how to prepare for that ash or the, the actions they might take to limit the impact of ash. And so it's, a, it's, it's kind of um, playing catch up. So I, a really important lesson from that is making sure people know what, what ash can do and how to be prepared for ash before the ash arrives. Because once the ash is on the way or arriving, it's, uh, it, it's very late to be communicating about that. Thank you. This is our last question for the evening. Thank you everyone so much for the submitted questions. I apologize that we couldn't get through all of them. Um, this question is a huge problem that I see all the time and I have a lot of compassion for. A lot of news and information circulates during a crisis and as an ordinary citizen, sometimes I get fooled by the wrong one. What do you as a volcanologist hope for us ordinary citizens to respond to these circulating news and information. So what advice could all of you give to everyone out there who is very understandably confused and thrown off by a lot of misinformation that circulates both on social media and on all of the entire range of media outlets around the world? Yeah, that's definitely a, it's a, it is a really hard one. We're in an age of information overload. Um, my advice would be to know who the official sources of information are and where to get that from, if it's from their website or from their social media account, and just try and follow them. That potentially that could just cut out all the noise, you know, and you can just see what the information is. It's what I do. Yeah, and, and more communication from those official sources is, is always better. Mm -hmm. um, misinformation breeds in a vacuum. There's a limited coverage of official information or it's not covering the topics people are asking about. Yes, I agree with that. Thank you. And I'd say to everyone out there, we can all help in this situation. Um, this misinformation might seem trivial if you're on the other side of the world, but we now live in a time where you could be tweeting or posting on Facebook in the UK and someone in Indonesia could be getting that information instantly and now they're getting multiple different sources of information saying competing things. So every single one of us can help to share that official information, keep pointing people to the official information, share the links to the official um, Twitter pages or Facebook pages or websites and keep sharing that official information. We can all do our part to help the volcano observatories and therefore helping the people who are actually being impacted by these events. So thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you very much to CBGHM for inviting us to be part of this 100 year celebration. It's incredible what you have taught the world from these many years of volcano monitoring and communicating these hazards. So thank you, Sally. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Supriyati. Thank you, Debbie. It has been a wonderful opportunity to learn from you all. Thank you. And Debbie is gonna say a few more things before we switch off. Okay, we'll give a very brief uh, closing in Indonesian. Uh, baik, terima kasih uh, 
para peserta webinar yang terhormat yang telah mengikuti acara ini dari awal sampai akhir. Begitu banyak poin-poin penting yang telah disampaikan oleh para ahli vulkanologi dari Selandia Baru maupun dari Indonesia. Kita tahu bahwa setiap erupsi ini selalu memberikan tantangan dan juga ini tidak bisa dijawab seluruhnya oleh para ahli vulkanologi karena keterbatasan dari apa yang kita tahu dan juga kita membutuhkan feedback atau masukan dari masyarakat untuk memperkuat sistem peringatan dini kita sehingga mitigasi bencana gunung api ini bisa dilakukan secara kolektif bukan hanya oleh para vulkanologis atau para ahli vulkanologi tapi juga partisipasi aktif langsung dari masyarakat juga akan membantu kita untuk mensukseskan mitigasi bencana erupsi gunung api baik di akhir acara ini nanti akan disampaikan link atau tautan tentang bagaimana mendapatkan sertifikat untuk mereka yang membutuhkan dan terima kasih telah mengikuti acara ini pada akhirnya kami ucapkan selamat siang Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you for everyone